This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Windsor Castle here. Yeah. We've got a fire in the Pirate Castle, Windsor Castle. Your information, this is confirmed as an incident, Homer. Windsor Castle. Windsor Castle. about half past 11 and uh, we thought it was a drill and we're proceeding down the relief road and I turned around to the lads in the back and said tip we've got to get a drill today of all days because we, we were very busy anyway then I looked across to the left and to the castle and I knew then it wasn't a drill so I was actually expecting Windsor's fire engine to be there and uh, to my dismay there was no other fire engine there I was on my Todd my first feelings was, um, well, we have got a serious fire here and we've got to get the grips of it, otherwise it's all going to go pear-shaped. When I first came in here, the two turrets either side of the Aquarius entrance were ablaze. But it was just seeing that bit of it all just sort of going away in clouds of smoke. From the outside of the building, it was just smoke, and you could see the fire through the windows of the building, and some flame coming out of the roof. But when you got inside, it was quite spectacular, because the fire was so hot that the heat went straight through the roof, so there was a red glow, and it was, it was white heat. It really was hot in there. As the fire spread, the battle to save the 900-year-old castle intensified. Seven fire brigades and 250 firefighters fought the blaze while the world's press gathered to watch. And looking on the television and seeing all these terrifying flames and smoke coming out of the, the castle, I felt the first thing I had to do was jump into a car and, and come up here. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. We've got unrivaled access to the world's leading historians, with hundreds of documentaries featuring everything from Boudicca to the British royal family. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and real royalty fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use code REALROYALTY at checkout. And one of the worst things, I think, was, was coming up the, the motorway coming here and seeing this, this glow and the, and the smoke pouring into the sky. And that, I think, was one of, the, one of the worst images of all. Meanwhile, Prince Andrew was amongst those who tried to rescue some of the castle's treasures. While the rooms close to where the fire started had been cleared due to rewiring work, other areas were fully furnished. Prince Andrew was with us, checking the rooms through the royal apartments to make sure that all the personal belongings were taken. And then he was actually coordinating with the fire brigade via his portable radio to uh, make sure everything was happening in the right order. The first area was this area, um, and, and some of this had already been done by the time I got here because there were people here. And having removed most of the passageway up to, I think it was another two rooms that, that way, including the, the white drawing room, um, we stopped at this bit because we then had firemen based up in, in this, this section of the, of the castle, stopping it from coming this way. Having cleared that end, it was a matter of then seeing what was going to happen at this end. And of course, at this end, uh, with the fire going in, in, in this direction, the danger was that it was going to reach the library, which is at, the, which is at this end of the, of, the, of the castle. And so we were stood here 
trying to make up one's mind as to which way we were going to go to next. When they took the lead off the roof, the fire then went through it, which evacuated all the smoke out of the, the Waterloo Chamber and the Grand Reception Room. And so we were able to go into the Grand Reception Room and clear that and the Waterloo Chamber. It was quite extraordinary because you could hear the flames in St George's Hall just beside it. And yet there was the Waterloo Chamber, completely impervious to all the pandemonium that was going on around it, like the sort of eye of a storm. It seemed entirely peaceful and the paintings just sitting there on the wall. It took, oh, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes to clear the Waterloo Chamber of all the paintings. And in clearing the paintings, no uh, conservationist today would ever contemplate doing what, what, what was happening there. The paintings that were above the balconies of the Waterloo Chamber were removed from their frames and two people held them over the balcony and there were two people at the bottom who then caught them. We got pictures which in any other circumstances we'd have taken about two days to get down. We got them all down in something like 20 minutes but for a few scratches and a couple of small holes or dents, really no damage was done at all. I asked my secretary to contact every removal firm in the area to send as many vehicles as they could with their men, which they did. They were actually queuing up down the long walk, waiting to be loaded to take the stuff away. Uh, and each vehicle, uh, as it left the quadrangle, um, we had a policeman go with it. Imagine all the priceless things that were on those vehicles was unbelievable. Three people lifted one of those bronze vases out of the Waterloo Chamber. One of them still has a back problem as a result of it. Um, and I don't think that, that three people would ever be able to lift that in normal circumstances. I then turned to walk out to see the carpet underway with um, at least 50 or 60 people underneath it, carrying it like a sausage on their, on their shoulders. But unfortunately, the front end had set off before the back end was ready. And there must have been two or three people who were hanging on to the, to the, to the, to the, to the back end of the carpet who were just being dragged out along with it. I mean, they were physically lying on the floor, being dragged out, and that was the way it went. The only way to move it from then onwards was to get the, uh, the army up, who could march in step and uh, they marched it down to the, uh, to the stables. And I noticed this little Gurkha sentry stood at the end, still in his guard post, and I thought to myself, well, you know, they've, I've heard all these stories about the Gurkhas, but he was just stood there on duty with a castle burning around around him, and he weren't going to move for nobody. My lads worked like Trojans. Um, they were in there risking everything. I mean, they do that anyway at normal fires, but this, there seemed to be something different. Yeah, 110% all the time. Uh, some of the lads went in over the course of the day, 11 times. We were actually looking at another fire head, see if we could attack the fire from another angle. And we found a tunnel, and we could see the fire burning at the end. And there was also some scorch marks on the, on the ceiling above us, but we decided to that we weren't in danger, that we could get to the end to see if we could fight the fire from there. Unfortunately, the ceiling chose to co collapse at that time. It landed on, on the floor, which we were underneath. And it, to me, it seemed as if the floor was coming down a couple of feet. It just vibrated down. It was most probably only a couple of inches. But uh, it was an art stopping moment for a, for a few seconds. Within hours, the flames had swept through some of the most historic rooms in the world's oldest occupied castle. Fanned by the wind, it now moved towards the northeast corner, away from the private apartments and where the firemen had built their fire breaks. Her Majesty the Queen had earlier joined the salvage workers, but now, like them, could only stand and watch as Windsor burned. Yes, 
Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales, raced from Norfolk to join his family. It was somewhere where I'd been brought up so, so, so much of my you know, childhood. So when I got here, it looked even more uh, of a scene of utter devastation than I would have believed possible. It made the blood run cold, you know. I was here as it was getting dark, just after it was getting dark, and uh, it's the most extraordinary sensation. Just there was nothing you could do; you just had to watch it, just, just, just burn. I mean, it looked, it looks like a chimney here, and on the night it just looked like a huge chimney with 60, 70 foot flames coming out of the top. It was horrendous, but it was lighting. It kept it sort of reasonably light, as far as I remember. And that sort of, sort of very mystical red, yellow light that you can get from a, from a, from a flame. I mean, it was, uh, it, was, it was a very sad moment for, for me to sit here and watch it, watch it burn. There was nothing that we could do. Uh, we'd got everything out. It was just a matter of letting it burn. After 15 hours, and one and a half million gallons of water, the fire was officially said to be extinguished. It was a smell, there's a smell of, of wood and, and, and steam because the, at that stage when the water had been put on the fire, there was steam still rising. I, I, I have a particular passion for St George's Hall because as a child, I mean, we used to muck around a lot in there and um, play badminton in there, believe it or not. Under the carpet, there's a badminton. Uh, you know, court marked out. And, uh, and so I mean, I, I spent a lot of time there. The fire had destroyed one fifth of Windsor Castle. 105 rooms had been damaged. The area around the private chapel devastated. Nine major staterooms, including the great banqueting hall of St. George's, were destroyed. I saw pictures and things long before I got there, but uh, by that time I had a pretty good idea. But the fire was out, so there wasn't there wasn't any of the drama of seeing things burning or anything like that. It, you just saw the, the remains, the, the sort of devastation which uh, had been caused in the whole of that area. Yeah, I felt that there was going to be a hell of a business trying to put it back again. I think. With the fire barely out, the attention of the world focused on the cause of the blaze jumping initially to the wrong conclusion. Somebody had put two and two together and made five. They um, said that there were restorers at work in the private chapel. Somebody else decided that restorers meant solvents. And somebody else decided that restorers had been at work with solvents and therefore had set fire to the castle. We, as you know, are not allowed to say anything to the press. They hammered on my door. They stayed there all night. They put office through the letterbox. Um, they were on the telephone all the time. I did feel uh, under siege at that particular moment. We, we've actually tested out the theory that how 
far would it take for a picture frame to lean into a curtain before it hits um, the lights and um, it would have to lean in an awful lot and everybody would have noticed it. Somebody would have said to the head of um, uh, paintings conservation, Violet Pemberton Pinkett, do you think that's safe? The investigators decided that the blaze had started in the private chapel. Extensive testing proved that a curtain too close to a spotlight used to illuminate the altar had caught fire. Within minutes, the flames had spread through the roof spaces into the adjacent rooms. The area around the old chapel suffered the greatest devastation. In the old chapel, there was a war memorial to the members of the household who died in the First World War, and an addition for the Second World War. And on the top of it is a little statuette of, of St. Michael. And there he was, still standing there, sticking out on the wall, um, slightly bent, but I mean, he, he was still there. It was rather touching. The survival of the statue was truly remarkable. For everywhere else, the real concern was how to make the building safe. We brought in uh, demolition experts who were lowered into the building and down the towers because the only safe way in was actually in a bucket from a crane and down into the towers. You couldn't go in from underneath in many instances. Um, and they methodically worked around the whole building, making it safe. Uh, once that had happened, English Heritage put in a, a, a team of people who picked their way through the debris, sifted everything into buckets and everything that was of potential interest when we came to rebuild later was logged, identified, put into a computer program and put into bread baskets and into store. That meant that if we wanted to put back the major rooms that had been lost, the very fine classical rooms, we actually had the material and we knew exactly where in the rooms it came from. Unless you actually went round the area that had been devastated, people had simply no idea what was involved. I don't know why particularly, but they took one look at this and said, you know, it's not, not, for, it's not for the state to do anything about it. It was a curious reaction, it seemed to me. I suppose they were horrified at the size of the, of the, uh, of the damage and, and didn't want to sort of commit any, any further uh, government funds to it. The problem with properties that belong to the government or to the state is they're not insured, so there was no insurance in this case because the government carries its own insurance. And somebody had the idea that if we opened the state apartments in, in Buckingham Palace and, and, and rearranged the entry fees to Windsor, we could probably make enough money to pay for the, for the restoration. So that's roughly what's happened. Although only open for 10 weeks a year, in the five years after the fire, over two million visitors have streamed into Buckingham Palace, with over a third of them from overseas. Hello. 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 Two adults. Okay, that's 23 pounds then, please. 18 pounds, please, sir. Thank you. That's nine pounds then, please. Okay, eight pounds nine, that's for 12 o'clock. Money for the restoration of the castle has come from three areas. Firstly, the opening of Buckingham Palace. Secondly, the new charges that were introduced for admission to the precincts at Windsor Castle from January 1994. And thirdly, from savings which we found from within the money which the government were already going to give us for the maintenance of the building. So effectively, at the end of the day, the castle's been restored without the taxpayer having to pay any additional money at all. The total cost of the restoration was estimated at 40 million pounds. Once the budget was set, the team had to be found to manage the project. We were appointed in the sort of spring of 93, and at that stage it was cold, it was damp, um, and it really was a particularly sort of miserable place uh, physically to begin to work in. There were some temporary roofs there to protect it from the rain. And it was a, it was a very deeply depressing place because you had the contrast of the, of the beautifully finished staterooms that had survived as opposed to the, the actual charred remains that we were faced with. Well, when we first arrived, Simon and myself looked at each other and thought, where do we start? And we went round and the, the, it dawned on us how massive the, the task was. Soon after arriving at Windsor, we realised that the, the biggest problem we were facing was water. Um, 
the estimates vary between two and three million gallons were poured into that fire. We realised very early on that water hadn't gone anywhere, that water had actually was still stuck within the fabric of the castle. And while it remained there, it was very difficult for us to envisage ever being able to put on ornate finishes back on, gold leaf back on, wall panelling back on, simply because the, the, the water would have destroyed it very, very soon after we'd put it back. We did a lot of research, we had probes inserted all over the building to monitor just where the water was, how fast it was drying out, and it became apparent it wasn't drying out at all. It actually was stuck behind, probably behind layers of plaster, behind layers of paint, behind layers of panelling. Environmental consultants said it would take 10 years to get the building dry, and that report arrived on our desks within about three days of being appointed, and uh, against the backdrop of needing to get on with the building, uh, we had a, our first little challenge here. Windsor Castle is not just a state property or a home to the royal family. It's also a scheduled monument, a building of historic importance. As such, any work undertaken must be supervised by a government agency, English Heritage. The, the initial perceived wisdom from English Heritage was leave it and let it dry in its own course of time. And uh, the prospect of the royal household sitting there waiting 10 to 15 years for this castle to dry itself out of its own accord was just completely unacceptable. English Heritage, I think, acknowledged that this was a rather um, difficult problem that they had to help us solve. And what they did allow us was to put in for scheduled monument clearances, to actually strip it back, to take up floors, to take out timbers, to take off panelling, to actually strip the whole castle back to its bare brickwork and bare stonework. turned out, once we'd sort of homed into that problem, that the areas most seriously affected by the firefighting water was in the uh, basement rooms, whereas upstairs, the areas that had been open to the sky for a long period of time, they were dry. That meant that we could tackle the building from, from a sort of top down. We did radar surveys to check whether the fire had damaged any areas of stonework and left sort of serious structural voids behind. Uh, we did surveys using rot hounds, which are dogs trained to sniff out areas of dry rot and wet rot, and we found many such areas. We then were allowed to introduce fairly passive um, dehumidification regimes and also occasionally heating to allow the building to dry out a little bit quicker. So that, that was a huge problem that could have been a major, major issue with English heritage. Um, had they not, I think, just worked alongside us and the household in, in realising that it was a, an issue which they had to give way on. The decision to allow the castle to be stripped back to the original stone was an important one. One of the consequences was to reveal some of its history. And I've always had a particular fascination for this castle. Um, uh, being uh, at heart rather rather an historian, I think. And I, I, I love all that uh, uh, feeling of history coming alive through the, the surroundings and through the associations that this place has, I think, in, through so many past generations. The castle was originally built as part of a chain of forts around London by William the Conqueror in the 11th century. But the most recent major building work was undertaken during George IV's reign in the 1820s by the architect Geoffrey Wyattville. Apart from redesigning many rooms, he transformed the external features. What you see today is largely Wyattville's work. What you actually saw on the surface was 19th century, and this led a lot of people to assume um, that Windsor was really little more um, than a 19th century revival castle. Well, the fire in burning off a large part of these lairs revealed that, in fact, there was an incredibly complex historical structure underneath Whiteville's outer lairs. This was most apparent in the kitchen area, where a 19th century roof was covering up a much older one. What had happened to it was that uh, Wyattville had come along and found this perfectly authentic medieval roof 
uh, but it hadn't looked medieval enough for him. This is very characteristic of the way the Regency looked at these things. Things had to look right. Appearance mattered more to them in a historic building than authenticity. He didn't think it looked Gothic enough, so he added a great deal uh, of purely decorative softwood ornament. The fire burnt a large part of that off, and it was clear that here was a genuine, very large and rather important medieval timber roof. The other find in the kitchen area, of course, which is most significant, was the Great Well. Um, we had known, um, I think many people had known, that there had been a Great Well somewhere in the area of the kitchen court. When the rubble was cleared, a medieval well reaching down 42 metres, 150 feet, to the level of the River Thames was revealed. Well, in a site as complex as Windsor, you would um, expect surprises, so to speak. Um, and, for instance, we found a, a sort of vein of very rich black earth um, underneath the kitchen court, which proved to be the, um, the contents of a medieval cesspit. Um, and we've um, taken as much of that as we could. Our laboratory sampled two litres of it, and they found evidence so far of 15 different kinds of meat and fish and 30 different kinds of fruit and vegetable. So there's the 12th century diet in the castle. Once all the... Uh, debris and everything else had, had been cleared away and the whole thing had been cleaned up and, and, and sorted out and the water had been drained and everything else. Then, obviously, the, the, the time came to, to start looking at what had to be done uh, to restore or replace or redesign all the burnt-out uh, rooms. Obviously, there was an opportunity here, not just to uh, put back what was in a sense, the, the good parts of it are the really interesting parts, but also to improve the whole area. The problem was really to get people to agree what we should do with the, with the main rooms. The Duke of Edinburgh gathered all the interested parties, such as English Heritage, the Department of National Heritage, as it was then, the Royal Institute of British Architects, and the Fine Arts Commission, and formed the Restoration Committee. He then personally showed them around the fire-damaged area, and suggested the work be divided up into blocks. Those rooms which could be put back as they were, while others offered opportunities for new ideas. I came to the conclusion that um, St George's Hall really, the, 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 the main building ought to remain, and, but if anybody wanted to design a new ceiling to it, they could. The grand reception room, they obviously, if you still had the walls, you really had to put the ceiling back the way it was before. And the rest, Anything could have happened except the red drawing room, which was one of a series of white, green and reds that were all designed by Wyatt at the same time. Uh, I then asked the Prince of Wales to chair a design committee whose task was to select the architects for the different blocks. Giles Downs was chosen to work on the parts of the castle where new ideas and solutions were needed. There was generation on generation of different architects, different designers, a lot of them using Gothic, and they were each reinterpreting the same basis of Gothic architecture in their own completely unique and distinctive way, which led us to the conclusion that what we should do is carry on that tradition and do our own reinterpretation of Gothic. When we saw Giles Downs's ideas, I must say they did stand out as being I thought remarkably imaginative. And not only that, but I think Giles Downs clearly has an incredible capacity for, uh, for understanding the, the sheer ge geometry uh, of Gothic architecture. And uh, he, he had a particular um, uh, uh, ability, I believe, to make the Gothic Contemporary. The only area where there was a, 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 a sort of, I suppose, a serious uh, discussion, and that was about the ceiling or roof of the of St George's Hall. I mean, I'm afraid to say that I, that I'm not, I've never been a great admirer of Wyattville, and uh, I thought that that what was done during King George the Fourth's time to Windsor was, in some parts of the castle anyway, disastrous. What was done to, to St George's Hall, I thought was awful. I mean, it must have been one of the great large rooms in, in this country. 
and uh, the destruction of the very painted ceiling, for instance, I think was an act of unbelievable vandalism. Uh, but anyway, they could do things like that in those days. There was nobody going to say, hang on a minute, it's listed, and you can't do this, you can't do that. Uh, so I, I felt St. George's Hall in particular was a really rather dreary uh, space in, in terms of what Wyattville had done to it. I think Wyattville had been uh, very much up against budgetary consta constraints by the time he got to uh, St. George's Hall, that his roof was a lot plainer than the, the, than the nature of that room merited. The point of that was that a lot of people wanted to build a hammer beam roof over St. George's Hall because they didn't like the, 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 the rather cheap roof that, or ceiling that um, Wyatt had put in under the original roof. The other thing was we didn't want the roof to appear above the, the level of the sort of battlements. And uh, there were purists who said, no, we've got to have a proper hammer beam roof. And, and we said, well, look, it's going to take years to, well, not years to design, for quite a long time to design, quite a long time to provide all the timber. And in the meantime, this place is going to be open to the elements. So the decision was taken with a certain amount of reluctance to put a modern roof as high as possible and then allow the design of a hammer beam ceiling, in a sense, within it. Looking at the hall, it wasn't the length that was a problem, it was the proportions. The shape, if you actually look at the cross-section of the hall, was exactly the same as a railway carriage, and it gave you that feel. It wasn't an English king's medieval anything in that sense. The proportions were all wrong. It needed to be made to feel much taller. The previous roof form, outer roof form, had gone back on. So we didn't have much extra height. We had three feet. What we could do, however, was to move down the springing points, the corbel stones in the walls. And that gave us enough to put in a whole series of stepped arch trusses. The wood came from oak forests as far afield as Herefordshire and East Anglia to just up the road in Windsor Great Park. So you have to select your oak very carefully at the beginning. It has to be very straight grained, it has to be carefully grown. You have to know as much as you can about the sources come from. If you had a tree that was leaning against a slope, it has an inbuilt um, tension, which when you chop it down is going to try and release, so you're going to get timbers which will bend more. Well, in St George's Hall, the distance between walls at one end is about a foot and a half different uh, at the other end. So, of the 14 trusses being made out of green oak, each one is slightly different. Many of the roof timbers that you see there today were growing as trees about um, three years ago. So when the oak is fresh, it's workable. You can create the lovely sort of moulded elements of that ceiling. And then in about 20 years time, when the oak is seasoned, it'll become as hard as nails. Too hard, in fact, to drive a six-inch nail into. Here we were trying to reuse the techniques of using green oak. Um, and we had to relearn the method of jointing those oak members so that when the timber dried out and shrank, the joints actually get stronger. It's a bit like those wooden Chinese puzzles that you take apart, very much like that. Um, and you have to think very clearly and logically about the order and allow for each to have a housing in the next without weakening the whole structure. A small army of 4,000 craftsmen then moved into the most exclusive building site on Earth. 78 miles of scaffolding and 12,000 delivery vehicles supported over 200 specialist companies who gradually and painstakingly used the best mix of ancient methods and modern techniques to rebuild and refurnish an area of 110,000 square feet of castle. Thank you.
I think it's the best job in Europe. It's because uh, the old methods and, and modern technology, you see? That's the way we work it. I mean, uh, they, when they built this place before, they only had candles. Bring it straight back onto the here. Uh, I can remember the first time I came here at Windsor to work. Uh, everything was new, I'd never seen anything like it before. Coming, coming down the drive into the place, uh, didn't know what was around the next corner. They could see glimpses of the castle. I can remember first getting into the compound, it looked like pretty much any other building site. And then when you come up the uh, steps up to the, the top of the North Terrace, it's this fantastic garden, takes your breath away. And everything's pretty awesome. The contractors who work at Windsor have become accustomed to this rather unique site. They have come from all over Britain, and many have actually lived near the castle in the Royal Mews. St George's Hall really is grander and I think and it's also provided the opportunity to put something at the east end of it so that we've chosen a, a huge reproduction of a design in St George's Chapel by Tresillion which is a rather attractive sort of round shape with a garter around it but this is this thing is about eight foot across and that'll be right at the end um, so that whole room I think will look um, tremendous uh, it, well, it does already, actually. The ceiling is once again adorned with the coats of arms of all the Knights of the Garter, the oldest order of chivalry in the world, whose patron saint is St. George. My only quibble is with this bit here. The track is, it, it almost got it off, but not quite. It's better, but it, it, it put a sort of terrible, sort of plasticky varnish there on it, which made it look like plastic. Do you see what I mean? Because it's all wood, but the treatment has made it go like that. If you look at that, you see? It's completely... It's the reason I it in, for some reason or other, but, but it, you see what I mean? If you get this sort of shine on it. Anyway, it's like a wax. But otherwise, it's absolutely... It's marvelous. While all this work was taking place at Windsor, in St. James's Palace, London, a team of restorers was using the opportunity to clean and repair the paintings that used to hang in the fire-damaged areas. is a mixture of chalk and gelatin, which is an animal glue. There are losses in the paint going down to the canvas underneath. I'm filling that so that it's completely even with the surface so that when it comes to retouching, we'll be filling just the area of putty. The crimson drawing room was part of a set designed by Wyattville for George IV. It was where the Christmas tree always stood when we spent Christmas at Windsor and where the presents were exchanged. The room was almost entirely destroyed by the fire, but because the other rooms in the set, the, the, the white and the green, survived, we thought it ought to be put back as it was. One of the improvements that had been put in in the, in the 60s in the Crimson Drawing Room had been the installation of a very large steel frame which tied together the sides of the bay window. During the fire, that steel beam was heated up to such a degree that it expanded and pushed out the, the bay window from the structure that it was sort of knitted into. In effect, it debonded itself from the main curtain wall and it started to move outwards. And from all accounts, people could actually see it moving and then the next day they saw it moving back. Obviously, it had been very badly affected by the fire. In fact, it was probably the area of external wall that most affected by the fire. We ended up having to dismantle that wall, um, reuse as much of the surviving stone as we possibly could, uh, but uh, rebuild it. And this time we didn't put back the steel beam that had done the damage that, uh, in the first place.
Well, so far as the Royal Collection is concerned, in the course of the restoration, particularly of the state rooms, um, all major decisions concerning the look of the rooms have been referred to the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh for their approval. Um, I think one of the most interesting examples of this would be the material in the crimson drawing room on the silk on the walls and the curtains, because previously um, that was a large 19th century pattern on the walls, uh, which in fact Queen Mary had installed in the 1920s. And the feeling that we had quite strongly was that a smaller scale pattern would be much more in keeping with the room. And in fact, we were lucky enough to find a small piece of the original silk that had been there in the George IV period. So um, with the Queen's approval, we were able to copy that and, and put that up in the place of the rather over-large pattern that had been there. One of the more demanding areas of, of the restoration has been looking at the way the decoration of the silk of the curtains has been handled, and really a very great deal of time and attention given to, to, to the most minute things which most people going into the room wouldn't even be conscious of there, but it's the sum of these small details that make a room work or not. treasures and works of art going back into the castle, only three will be missing. This painting of Frederick, Prince of Wales, and his family by George Napton replaces the one lost in the state dining room of George III by Sir William Beechey. It will hang above an exact copy of the Augustus Pugin sideboard, which was also reduced to ashes. Both painting and sideboard were too big to get out. The third loss was the Father Willis organ built for Queen Victoria, which was part of the private chapel. So the chapel was sometimes chapel and sometimes passageway. You close the doors and open the curtains, and then it became a chapel, and you close the curtains and open the doors, it became a passage. So uh, I had a look at the plans because I thought there might be some possibility with, the, with of restructuring it so that there would be a dedicated a private chapel, which wouldn't be a passage. And it so happened that it, it fitted in almost exactly with, its, with, the, with the window above the Aquarius door, with that sort of uh, diagonal door in the corner of the quadrangle. And it just fitted in such a way that you could make an octagon, which was of, of the rest of what had been the chapel, which was on the central axis of, of uh, St. George's Hall. So that really um, suggested to me there was a real opportunity there to, to make a, a great improvement in the layout of that area. What we needed was something in that space which would act as an antechamber to St George's Hall and would turn this grand processional route through 90 degrees and would also fit within the remains left after the fire. Uh, an eight-pointed star, an octagon, actually fitted very well into the geometry of what was left after the fire and it's an excellent form to turn a corner. You can naturally enter it on the angle and you feel quite right about going out the other side. The only better one would be a circle, I guess, but an octagon worked very well. So we went for an octagon form. It needed to be lightweight. We couldn't put a heavy stone structure there or anything like that. So we looked at doing a structure in timber, in fact an umbrella in timber, with eight columns. And we did a little diagram. You could always imagine it being dropped into the hole left by the fire, like something arriving from space or on a helicopter or whatever. In the octagonal and anteroom, some of the forms he wanted to create and the shapes that you see here, it's just not possible to do in natural oak. I mean, you'd have to chop down half the forests of Europe to actually find the, the shapes in, in the natural oak that Giles wanted to create. So there, he, he again, working with oak, um, he went into a new technique that's called glue laminated. And what you do is you take a series of strips of oak, and because of the, the new glues that we have these days, you can bend them into shape, glue them, and they will hold. And so it was really fascinating to work with him and actually see the way that his mind began to un unravel these wonderful ideas and shapes and forms. 
the geometry of the, the structure itself, the detail of it, of an obvious historical inspiration would be um, the crossing at Ely, which is a very fine example of medieval English carpentry. Um, we looked at the geometry of that, and I looked at a way that I could develop a geometry for this particular octagon using very simple um, Gothic techniques, if you like, with a pair of compasses. Then with the whole restoration project scheduled to finish in November 1997, in time for the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh's 50th wedding anniversary, disaster struck. Once again, fire was the cause. We got a phone call on a Monday morning um, a few weeks or a few months ago to say there'd been a fire at the factory and six of those columns, which were six of the eight columns we needed, had been destroyed. Now, potentially, that could have completely derailed the project because by then we had committed ourselves to finishing by November 97 and everything was moving in that direction with this very careful planning. But uh, clearly, if we didn't have our lantern lobby, we'd lost, if you like, the jewel in the crown. Initially, there's huge panic and, and uh, frantic energy, but we, we, when we actually got up there and re-sequenced operations, we go up there and talk to the particular craftsmen involved, again, use the Windsor factor, so this is very special. We have a very special occasion coming up in November. And we got their support to build a new shed alongside the shed that had been built down to salvage what they could and start working double shifts. With just six months to go to the 50th wedding anniversary date, the contractor had completed the work and was able, with a certain amount of pride, to deliver the key element of the new room, the lantern. Have you been doing this? This is the coin. Is that the coin? It's the coin, yeah. is it? Wonderful. Would you like to fit it? to put it in? You're, you're bringing it in. Do you want to put it in with the adhesive so it's in and fixed? Well, I need to get it wrong, I think so. <laughs> So you, you want to put it? Trust me, I well, I'm quite happy to put it. A little <laughs> bit of glue in the bottom. It just it literally drops, just drops in the hole. But does it have to go in a particular? Does it face yes, it does. It faces the 19, the 1997 faces mm. St George's Hall, so it's got to go in a certain way. It's in now. It's in. That looks straight. It's actually got to the stage of being almost finished, is it? Yeah. That silly. I think it's rather wonderful. But I was rather hoping that at certain times of the day, you know. That Light might sort of come in and I don't know you get any shafts of light sometimes. No, I think it's I think it's marvellous. But it couldn't it couldn't be anything other, I think, than than contemporary, could it? I mean it's not a, just a reproduction. It's not what they love to call a pastiche. And it's unbelievably complicated. I mean the, the geometry to get you know the, the balustrade right. This modern Gothic ceiling is part of the transformation of a space created alongside the lantern lobby into a permanent private chapel. There are three windows, I mean one window, but in three sections at the southwest end of the chapel, which uh, we thought might be an idea to put a stained glass window in there that uh, 
somehow as a memorial to the fire and what happened after it. So we got some designs, but in the end, we suggested that it might show the, the aftermath of the fire at the bottom, and then a fireman coming in with a hose through one window and a salvage man coming in, and that gave the opportunity to salvage something. So he's carrying out a picture of, of what. <laughs> There is a completely new wooden spiral staircase leading to a balcony in the chapel, which the choir will use. Is it safe to go? Yeah. the green man. Because it fits into such a curious place, there are odd, what, there's an odd corner left as a, as a uh, vestry, and there's an odd corner left where you can put a, <laughs> an organ, and there's another little platform place over in one corner where you can have a choir. So, but I mean, it, it, it's a very odd, I mean, the chapel itself is all right, but these other bits are just odd spaces that got left uh, by fitting it into this extraordinary con juncture between the east side and the, and the north side. Beautifully put together. I do believe it's obviously of enormous importance to to restore it, I don't think we owe it um, to the future, nothing else. And this has been one of the great things about the restoration, I think, is the, the sheer magnitude of the, um, of the skills that still exist in this country. And they are wonderful people, and, and now we have a, a, a testament to their skills and their love and dedication. I mean, they're the ones who deserve all the credit, not, to, not people like me who just sat, you know, in a committee for a short term. If you couldn't get off on having been part of this, then you're a sad soul, I'd have thought, because it's just well, it's wonderful, isn't it? I think it'll last. Well, that's all I think. You know, to be done, and it was done. I mean, it was burnt down, and, and people were found to put it back. And that's what it's all about. After all, it belongs to all of us, you know. We set ourselves initially a, a target of doing it for within 40 million, and we said we'd hope to get it done, um, finished by the spring of 1998, and I hope we'll be well within 40 million, 37 million perhaps, somewhere in that area, but well below the budget. And um, we hope to have it all finished and ready um, at the time of the Queen's golden wedding anniversary this 20th November, so ahead of schedule too. Five years to the day after the fire ravaged the castle, Her Majesty the Queen unveiled a plaque to commemorate its rebuilding. Windsor Castle was restored. Thank you all for coming, and I hope you will enjoy seeing Windsor restored. It is amazing what has been achieved in five years. To all the 4,000 or so people who have worked at various times here on this project, I can't begin to describe how much it means to us to have Windsor back and looking better than ever before in time for the celebrations for next week. More especially, it is perhaps the best anniversary present we could ever have wished for. Thank you. An extraordinary night and uh, you get so close to a project like this when you're working on it for three or four years that you really find you don't trust your own feelings about it. 
So although I've been thinking, well, it's okay, you know, it's all right, it's great to hear other people say so. My part obviously was only very small, and uh, the old fire brigade acted as a, a big team, if you like. But uh, it's nice to see the whole royal family here now, especially the troubles they've had. But they've really done us proud. Well, I said to Commonwealth heads of government uh, that um, uh, the Queen and Prince Philip's 50th wedding anniversary was, come, uh, was coming, would they be uh, willing to contribute to a gift? And I must tell you that this is the only Commonwealth venture that has been hugely oversubscribed. <laughs> Every one of them said, of course, and uh, as you know, this is the one here, there are two paintings that have also been given. And, and they, all the heads of government said yes, yes, yes. It was a very big piece of furniture, and again, the government might have I said, don't move it, it's too big. Oh, really? <laughs> I should have been here myself with my own little wild world. Very well done. Thank Brilliant. You, sir. It looked good as it was being done, but to go away for a little while, come back and see everything exposed, pictures on the wall, really good. It's an amazing job, once in a lifetime job. It, I'm really proud to, be, to have been a part of it. I mean, to, to go down in history as, a, as the contemporary part of the castle. <laughs> no, we've, we've done all this screen. We've done that. And uh, yeah, I feel very proud, very proud to be part of a heritage that will probably go on for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's a once in a lifetime uh, occasion, achievement, call it what you want. But I couldn't have dreamed of it, really. It's been challenging, the pressure has been there. At the end of the day, you can see for the finished results for yourself. Well, I think to see it as it is now is a credit, really, to everyone that's worked here since we left, because uh, unfortunately, when I did leave, it wasn't quite a bit of a mess. I have a real affection for the, for the place. You know, it would have been awful not to have, have restored it as lovingly as possible. Now, I think that uh, with the, the restoration, more and more people will be able to see what has been done here. Uh, and uh, well, I hope they'll feel that it's all been worthwhile.